Okay, thanks for showing up, and my talk is uh, From Clouds to Roots. Uh, I'm Brendan Gregg from Netflix. And I'm gonna be talking about how we do root cause analysis. Netflix has a, a massive AWS EC2 clouds, very well known, it's often used as an example of using Amazon EC2. We have lots of Linux, lots of CentOS and Ubuntu. We also use FreeBSD for content delivery and we're reaching 33% of the US internet traffic at night. Performance is critical. We have over 50 million subscribers now and performance very much matters to them and also for us in terms of cost. I'm Brennan Gregg, I've spoken at Surge before. It's great to be back. Uh, I'm now a senior performance architect at Netflix and I'm working on Linux and FreeBSD performance both on the cloud and also on the, uh, the Open Connect appliances which are doing the streaming. Last year at Surge, I saw a great talk by Coben Watson. You can watch that on YouTube. Uh, this year, he's now my manager. So, and he's also still hiring, so maybe someone in this room watching my talk, next year you'll be uh, working with us as well. So I'm gonna go through the Netflix cloud, how it works. Uh, ASG clusters, Hystrix, the, the Simeon army, and also how it may fail, despite all of the, uh, the efforts that's gone into the architecture. Uh, why root cause performance analysis is still needed, and then how we do that for cloud-wide analysis, the various tools that we use, and also instance analysis. And it's various terms. Now, it's quite interesting personally for me because previously uh, I've worked in other environments where I've always had many uh, very detailed tools available, such as Dtrace um, and, and, and other low-level CPU tools because I'm working on bare metal machines. And to go into the cloud where I have Linux, well, I don't have Dtrace, and I don't have bare metal access because I'm now running everything inside Zen Guests, uh, it, it was, I, I certainly thought that there would be many, many things I would not be able to do. And certainly myself and other colleagues who are used to a, a more uh, performance debugging rich environment certainly wondered how companies like Netflix and Google and Facebook survived when you don't have many of these tools. And so uh, I've been discovering that and I've also been contributing and working on these tools and, and it's great. And there's actually lots of things we can do even though we're in these environments, as we'll see. So the Netflix cloud, so this is just to give you a, a quick rundown on how it works, how it's architected, and why root cause analysis isn't needed that often. So we have a very large EC2, EC2 footprint. We are using S3. Uh, everything's fronted by elastic load, load balances. We have a lot of Cassandra for storage and, and, a, and a growing amount of elastic search. And the actual function of, the, of Netflix is implemented by services or applications and multiple logical uh, service teams. Uh, to give you just an, another high level view of how that works, there are different uh, APIs and that's, there's, there's multiple service teams that will satisfy those. Of course, I've got FreeBSD down there for the, uh, the physical uh, CDN that we build. So when you're actually watching a movie or watching a TV show, that's coming off free, a physical FreeBSD box usually. Uh, but then everything else, all the metadata and using the interface goes through AWS. With Netflix, Netflix has, has a very interesting culture. I really, I, I really enjoy it. Uh, the, the, a lot of other people seem to enjoy it. The culture deck has had over nine million views, which is unusual for, I, I guess, what's a, a product of HR, but it's actually really popular. Uh, engineers have development freedom, so service teams can choose their own tech and their own schedules and they can purchase and use cloud instances without approvals. So the Netflix environment changes fast. I'm not sure when there's performance issues or performance outages that we need to debug, you're never sure what a service team is deploying next because they're free to do whatever they want, so long as they're responsible for it when it then breaks. Uh, and also they're free to do it on their own schedule. So it's, Netflix is a, a large and growing company with a lot of engineers and Things change quickly. We do use a lot of open source technology, and we also develop a lot of open source technology. So netflix.github.io, and there's, there's tons of our internal software is now available that other people can use. To give you an idea of what the actual cloud instances look like, we have a base AMI, uh, Linux, CentOS, or Ubuntu. Uh, within that base AMI, it may have other things as well. So we may have uh, optional Apache web server, Memcached, 
Uh, there are one service team decided to run on Node.js because freedom and responsibility, they're allowed to do that. And um, so now I'm doing some Node.js uh, performance debugging on Linux, which is exciting as well. We also have our own monitoring tool called Atlas. Uh, on the instances, it also has various performance tools that we've been developing. Java is, is what many of the service teams are using, but not all of them, and uh, Tomcat to actually deploy the application. And within Tomcat, we have uh, various Netflix libraries and APIs, and uh, custom metrics come out of server. So how does it actually work, and how do we get away with scalability and reliability? EC2, in clouds in general, you, you need to plan for uh, things being unreliable when you, when you have a very large distributed system. And there are six factors, and I'll go through each of these, six different problems and how uh, they're solved. And many of us are, are deployed on, who's, who's actually on EC2 right now in the room? So you have a lot of people on EC2. So you're probably already doing many of these, so I'll go through them quickly. Auto scaling groups. Uh, with Netflix, we have Asgard is the uh, web interface for creating instances, creating applications, and managing all of it. It's also open source, so I believe other companies have, have fired it up and, and got it working as well. With Asgard, we create applications and they create auto scaling groups. Uh, that will have a scaling policy to define the limits on the number of instances to use and whether that's gonna check load average, latency, or some other metrics. Those metrics come either from Amazon CloudWatch or for, from our own server. So auto scaling groups, these will automatically add instances to accommodate bursts of load uh, and also remove them so that we save costs and we don't uh, over, over create, create too many instances that we need. One problem with this, even though it works really well, is if we have a broken policy, you can do false scaling. And so um, someone might have used a custom metric from server that hasn't been tested properly. It's basically giving a false alarm, and so we end up scaling up uh, much too quickly. And the metric is just broken. And so adding instances is not actually helping the problem. It's just costing Netflix money. So that's something that we address with alerts and audits. And, and if scaling starts to uh, appear to go out of hand, we need to check it and make sure that that makes sense. HG clusters are used. So this is how code versions are really deployed. And uh, we use red, red black, black deployments. Traffic is managed by uh, elastic load balancers. And that also gives us the freedom to set up canaries. And so if I'm a service team and I want to, I've made a change, and maybe that affects performance, I can siphon off a little bit of traffic to a single canary instance of the new code and see how that works. And if that looks okay, I can then do a, a, a full ASG for the new software, and then move a lot more load over. Uh, these red-black uh, ASG clusters, this is what Asgard provides. Uh, they give us fast rollback if needed. So if things start to go wrong at scale, then we can just switch back to the previous uh, cluster. And so usually they'll both be handling load at the same time, and over a period of a week or whatever it is, the developers will move all the load from one version to the other version. And so it's, it's very easy just to, just to step back if things look, look like they're not going well, which leads to another problem. This architecture is great, and so uh, it's, it's, as, as a developer, you, you, you don't have fear of causing too many outages. There's so many ways to check it with real load before you hit problems. But also, if you start to become risk adverse and, if, and, you, and you've made a software change that makes sense, this is why you wrote it, and then it isn't going so well on the Canary or isn't going so well on the new ASG, uh, then you may roll it back without having fully root caused that code. And so while it's great and gives you the, the uh, fault tolerance of uh, rapid recovery, uh, we also do need to think about root causing things because software, software engineers put effort into make this change in the first place. We don't just, don't just want to roll back and throw it away. We do need somehow to debug it so that we can keep making forward progress. Hysterix is, is another important part of the Netflix architecture. Um, Hysterix is also open source. It's a library for latency and fault tolerance. The uh, dependency requests that my service can make will go through Hysterix, and Hysterix understands uh, backup dependencies. It has thread pools for managing dependency requests. And uh, 
supports timeouts, load shedding, and, and a circuit breaker. So, for example, if I, if I was making a, a dependency request and it was taking more than, and I can set up my threshold, it was taking more than 100 milliseconds, Hystrix may just time that out and then go to a, a secondary. Uh, this gives us fault tolerance for instances just dying. So as a single instance that many other services were dependent upon dies, automatically Hystrix has redirected those requests to other instances. Uh, we also have a ribbon IPC library, uh, also NIWS, which adds even more fault tolerance. As for redundancy at a larger scale, uh, Zool is the uh, proxy for device API traffic, and Zool is able to route traffic to different availability zones if one goes down. And so everything goes through Zool. Both Zool and Hystrix, since they're there at the forefront of when things start to go, go wrong with performance, they're heavily instrumented, and so we take many, many metric feeds from them into Atlas, our internal uh, performance monitoring system. The Simian Army is another important aspect of how Netflix works at scale, and uh, that ensures we do regular testing of all sorts of different failure types to ensure that the cloud handles it. And if you're a developer at Netflix, you don't have to, like, you are forced to think about all the failure cases that you, that you may encounter because if Amazon doesn't do it to you, the Simian Army will do it to you. At some point, you will have to, your, your code will have to have dealt with those failure cases. And so it forces people to, to write those test cases. And of course, we, when we run the, the, the Simian Army, we discover instances that don't handle it properly and they need to be fixed. So um, we're also hiring chaos engineers, and so Netflix has now set up chaos engineering, and the, the lead manager, I believe, has called himself the chaos commander. And so if you have a, a natural talent of just breaking things, you could become a chaos engineer. I think I've unwittingly worked with a number of uh, chaos engineers in the past. Uh, and the last part is just monitoring everything, Atlas, Alerts, and Kronos, which I'll go into more detail. So in summary, Netflix is, is very good at automatically handling failure, and uh, issues often lead to rapid instance growth. Instead of uh, me getting paged at 3 a.m. or whatever it is, uh, it, it's set up so that, so that if, if code starts to behave badly, if there's a way out of just scaling it up, that's what it's going to do. This is good for, for customers, because if you're, if you're an end user of Netflix, it will automatically scale up and uh, to deal with those performance issues so that you're not exposed to them. And it's also good for engineers because, let's say I, I do have a latent performance issue, and it only happens at load, it only happens at, at nine o'clock or, or midnight, let's say we launch a new season of House of Cards or Orange is the New Black, and, and now there is a performance issue I've created, and now that's really uh, being felt. What's likely to happen is uh, we will scale up the instances to accommodate the load. And then when I get to work the next day at nine o'clock, I will see that we've scaled up way too much and then, and then deal with the performance issue then is, is a measure of cutting costs. But it hasn't hurt customers in the meantime because we've just scaled, it, as a workaround, we've just scaled the instances around it. And also it hasn't woken up the engineer and gotten them out of bed. They can fix it nine to five when everyone's at work and, and they can talk to their teammates and they can talk to managers. And so it's, it, it works for, for everyone. Um, just to give you an idea of all those different problems and the areas, how they fit together, I've drawn a picture of a, a typical Netflix stack. And so applications and ASG clusters, uh, usually two ASGs on top of each, three availability zones for redundancy and so on. Uh, I should mention that this is a typical Netflix stack. There are exceptions, so, so some service teams are running Apache Web Server and some, one service team is running Node.js. So with the Netflix arch architecture being very good at fault tolerance and handling performance issues, the reasons we end up doing root cause performance analysis, the first one is obvious, it's when growth becomes a cost problem. And so the ability to auto scale up has, has made the customers happy and the engineers happy, but after a few days, we're gonna start worrying about costs. And so we need to debug that and root cause and, and, and find out why there was a regression. Another reason is that instances or rollbacks don't work. And uh, 
So there could be a dependency issue, a networking issue inside AWS, and simply adding instances isn't going to dig you out of that hole. Um, those, those ones are, are more likely to, you, you'll get paged because you need to fix it more immediately. Uh, a fix might be needed for forward progress. And so uh, I've debugged a few of these where, you, where we'll have a service team who's running a very old version of Linux or an old uh, Amazon instance type. And the reason is they think it's faster, or well, they've measured it and it is faster. And, and they've used the red-black approach and they've tried the new Linux version. And I guess when that decision was first made, it wasn't such of a problem. But as the years drag on, so for example, Linux 2.6.21, if you think of all the performance enhancements that have been added since 2.6.21, uh, right now it means you're actually missing out on a lot of, uh, there's a lot of uh, performance gains that you could be having that you are missing out on by staying on the older version. So uh, debugging, um, cases like this is important because uh, service teams, for one, for one reason or another, have found s stepping up to the next version is a regression, and so they've stayed on the old version for many, many years. And because of that, they've, they've lost out on later games. And maybe they've stuck to the old version because they've just got some single tunable parameter uh, that, is, that only makes sense on the really old version of Linux or the really old version of whatever it is, Cassandra or Java. And that tunable parameter doesn't make sense in any of the future versions. And when you try to test it out and you make the change, that parameter, it hurts performance so much that all of the future gains get dwarfed by just this one bug that hasn't been root caused. And so once you, once you root cause that bug and say, oh, you, you, you set this tunable that only made sense on this ancient version of the software, once you've got that fixed, then suddenly you can migrate up the, the future versions and things get much faster. Another reason we want to do root cause performance analysis is to understand scalability factors for capacity planning and software design. And so uh, root cause, the analysis process is from cloud to instance. Some cloud methodologies for resource analysis are any resources exhausted, CPU, disk, network. Uh, and that's, that's pretty common, pretty standard. And many of these will have auto-scaled themselves out of trouble anyway. Metric and event correlations are very useful for, for a, a wide cloud, a, a, a very large cloud. When things got bad, what else happened? Especially at Netflix, with freedom and responsibility, service teams can deploy whole new databases or software or languages. And it, it, it becomes important to, for everyone to understand what's going on. And so to correlate, performance went down when the service team started to, to deploy you know, whatever nifty database or whatever it was so that we can correlate them quickly. Uh, latency drill downs. So tracing the origin of high latency from request down through to dependencies. It's pretty straightforward. I have a, my requests are getting too slow now, 100 milliseconds. What is the breakup of that? What are the downstream dependencies? What's their latency? Um, and we can also do the use method at the cloud scale. And so for every service team, what's their utilization, saturation, and errors? What's the utilization of their current instances, which should actually scale with the ASG? Um, what saturation metrics exist for a service team? So, so there's lots of queues that we can check, queue lengths, time spent queued, and also any errors as well. Instance methodologies. Log analysis solves a lot of problems. Uh, the Linux kernel might be telling you what's going wrong, and you can see that with D message straight away. Looking at GC logs in case there's GC times, Apache logs, Tomcat logs, and so on. The use method for an instance is, is also very useful where you're going through each of the hardware and software resources and checking them individually for utilization, saturation, and errors. Micro benchmarking. I seem to be doing more micro benchmarking now. Um, and this is one difference going to being inside a Zen guest or a hardware virtualized guest, is there are some things in Amazon I can't see directly, but I can micro benchmark them. And so I might be interested in a particular hypercall, um, some resource, CPU resource that I'm using, and how, how, is, how does that change from one version of Zen to another? Uh, because if you're deploying on EC2, you might be on Zen 3.4, you might be on Zen 4.0 or 4.2, and um, some of the hypercalls can actually make performance differences in your application. And 
since I, I can't log into the Amazon bare metal machines and inspect that directly, but I can micro benchmark them, and so I can get information out that way. Drill down analysis, so decomposing request latency and repeat similar to the cloud level and other system performance methodologies. Not everything is root caused, and so if you say, I had a bad instance and I killed it, that means you didn't root cause it. Uh, and it's really annoying, but, but uh, you have to, sometimes it, it may be efficient to just kill bad instances. It really, really irritates me because I love debugging and getting to the bottom of things. But uh, in terms of efficiency, if, if someone at Netflix spends a week debugging a bad instance and they finally find out that it is because of a bad disk on Amazon, it's five days of time that the engineer has lost. It's really hard work when you don't have bare metal access to the, to the hypervisor or the host. And so it can be difficult work to figure this stuff out. And it may be efficient for that service team to simply kill the bad instance and let the auto-scaling group uh, replenish it. Of course, the problem is I don't like killing bad instances, but I understand that in terms of efficiency, this is what some people might need to do. Um, they can be the, an early warning of a global issue. So, so if, obviously, if you kill something and don't debug it, you don't know what's going on. Um, I've come up with the bad instance anti-method uh, just to, to understand that. This is where you plot request latency per instance, find the bad instance, terminate it, and then someone else's problem. Uh, and at Netflix, it's awfully easy because we have, um, on Atlas, you can do the Atlas Exploder where it will give you the request latency per instance, and then just click a button, and I can just say kill it. It's almost, almost like a, a really bad computer game, but like, just kill the bad ones, and then everything's good, and go to level two. So cloud analysis. Cloud analysis tools uh, made and used at Netflix. I'll go through each of these, and then I'll go down to instance analysis, which is where we're really doing the root cause analysis. Uh, in general, monitor everything. You can't tune what you can't see. I've come up with a, this will make more sense in a moment, I've come up with an overall diagram of how we do the cloud-wide analysis from when there's a, an incident which will present itself as an Atlas alert, or over time, a service team's footprint has grown and it starts to become a cost issue. So we have another tool called ICE that can identify issues of cost. And then we go into the dashboards and Kronos and so on. So to go through each of those, and that diagram will make a bit more sense, um, Atlas is our monitoring system that we've built in-house. We can create custom alerts on thousands and thousands of metrics, uh, emails or pages. Uh, fairly straightforward, fairly straightforward learning system. It works. It's critical. If Atlas does give you an alert, the next step is usually to check the dashboards. So each service team has their own custom dashboard uh, where they choose what, what to be displayed. And you can create as many custom dashboards as you like. Uh, and the dashboards are useful to confirm that there really is an issue, and it can also be a launching point for more deeper analysis. If I click on any of the graphs, I will go into uh, the Atlas metric view. So I'm not going to also do, there's my explode button, so I can, I can click on one of these and explode it by some dimension. So I might want to explode a graph by ASG group, or by region, or by instance, or by some other dimension, and then see how it varies. These are cloud-wide and per service, uh, and they're the starting point for issue investigations uh, to confirm and quantify, look for historic trends. Um, one graph that uh, all Netflix employees would be very familiar with is the one at the bottom. Uh, this is the cloud-wide streams per second, and as it turns out, this is, uh, we will create alerts on anything that has a good uh, signal-to-noise ratio so that it's worthwhile to investigate, and this one actually is, is very, very, uh, has a very high signal to, to noise uh, ratio. It's, what it's showing is how many uh, times per second uh, someone hit play on something in Netflix. And you can see the daily pattern, and it, and also the weekly pattern, it tracks day by day very, very closely. Uh, in, in part because Netflix has so many users, so if, the, uh, if there is a deviation on the streams per second by just a few percent, that's a very, very good indicator that something's going wrong. It's, it's interesting because as a metric, we're not reporting, we're not relying on failure to be 
synchronously reported to us. It's the absence of it working. It turns out to be a very good indicator that something's gone wrong. Because you don't have to rely on errors being reported correctly, all, all sorts of things working. It's just the absence of this happening when it trends. There's actually two lines there. One is the week before, so the, the red line is current and the black line is the week before. But they're so close, you can't really see the, the pixels. They track each other so, so well. So a small deviation in this, we know something's gone wrong and we investigate. Atlas metrics for when we investigate uh, them in more detail. So the, the main view looks like this. I've actually plotted uh, average response time, 99th percentile and 95th percentile. And there's an interactive graph so we can mouse over it and get some summary statistics straight away. And so uh, Atlas is, a, is really important for us. It's what everyone uses at Netflix to debug uh, performance issues. It's, it's a big system. It deals with billions and billions of metrics, but it also has a lot of uh, architecture so that it can roll them up quickly. So that I can go to Atlas and say, show me this metric for all of Netflix, or show it to me just for my application, or just for one instance. And it can very quickly give me the graphs. Uh, it also has uh, URLs that I can share in chat rooms. So if we, if we are recourcing or doing an issue investigation, we can all share the, the URL. Everyone can jump onto the same Atlas page very quickly. Um, it has system metrics, all the standard ones you might expect from SNMP, and applica custom application metrics that we add ourselves. It doesn't, it's not the prettiest looking uh, performance monitoring GUI out there, but it is effective. It like really gets the job done. So it's something we, we use every day. I guess we should make it a bit prettier. Um, Kronos is another important tool that gets used early on in issue investigations. Kronos is our change tracking tool. And with uh, Kronos, you can uh, look, at, look for certain levels of criticality in terms of uh, events. I, can, I might break it down. I know an app is misbehaving, so just select an app and show me what events happened on that app. It's giving me the, the historic view um, and, and then breaking it down. I can do custom breakdowns. I might want to break down events by criticality, uh, message type, application type, uh, region, and so on and so on. Um, and then it's got the event list. The event list, I can quickly click on things. I might see uh, update actions. I don't, I don't care about those excludes, so it takes it away quickly. It's, it may not be uh, a lot to look at, but it's just a really critical part of uh, perf uh, recoursing performance investigations. Um, Kronos uh, and Atlas both get, both get used basically on everything we debug. And uh, it's the size and velocity of Netflix engineering that makes Kronos pretty important because uh, teams are allowed to change things whenever they feel like they're now allowed to deploy uh, new software, software whenever they feel like, so long as they're responsible for it. And Kronos is how we can very quickly find out who's done what, so who's been naughty on the cloud, and then we can uh, then talk to that service team. Um, so Atlas and Kronos are, are, are pretty straightforward, and you probably already have tools like this in your environment. You may not have something like this in your environment. Uh, Mogul is a, a little bit more, uh, more advanced. It's comparing performance with per resource demand. And so, we're, so you pick, say, an application, and uh, it's plotting latency and throughput. What Mogul will do is then take Atlas's massive database of billions of metrics and do statistical analysis and try and find correlations. And then it'll show you the top five uh, metrics that are correlated. There's different types of metrics Mogul will use. The main one it uses is demand which is the average response time times throughput. So it's seconds per second that a, say, a downstream dependency was doing work. And what's nice about Mogul is th there are some uh, performance monitoring or performance tracing tools that will add information to your requests as it work works its way around your distributed environment. And that's great. It can add a lot of overhead. It can be expensive to do. Uh, Mogul doesn't need to do that. It's just looking for statistical correlations. How do I know that that uh, resource, uh, that graph, was all consumed by this application if I didn't track them? And the answer is I don't. I'm just looking for a pattern match between. That resource may be used by 10 other services, but if its graph closely matches 
my service, and in this case it does, the resource demand to whatever the green thing is closely matches my throughput, and I'm trying to understand my throughput, then it's probably a good idea to go and uh, understand that resource and find out what that one is. So correlation is not causation, so it just gives us clues, but it's a quick way to find interesting metrics out of the thousands of metrics we have available that are worth uh, investigating. Now, of course, if you're a service team, you, you probably think you, you already know the correct dependencies and metrics to put on your dashboard. Mogul's actually good at discovering ones you didn't think about. So you may have assumed, I, I, I have to call, I have to get timestamps, or I have, to, I have to get region information. That's a, that's a free, basically a free request. It's always gonna have very low latency. I don't need to put that on my dashboard. That's never gonna be a problem. And Mogul will find out, will, will find out where you've made mistakes with your assumptions. You just check everything and say, yes, this, this service that you thought was always gonna be very quick is now misbehaving and its graph matches your graph. So you should check them out. SOP is another dependency graphing tool. It, this one is based on tracing and so when, when you use SOP, it will trace uh, where, where packets move around, where requests go. And so I might say, here's my application. For one hour, show me uh, what dependency requests it was doing. And so it can uh, print out the, the tree, the app, and their depends, dependencies. Uh, again, it's, it, it can be useful because at the Netflix environment, things can change and you may start using dependencies you weren't expecting. And so a quick way to, uh, to visualize that. And you, of course, these are interactive. You can mouse over it and then drill down into the dependencies. Uh, and then the last cloud-wide uh, tool I, I wanted to show for uh, cloud analysis is ICE. Um, ICE is the Netflix AWS usage dashboard. And so it's pretty obvious when, when, say you have a performance regression or performance issue and your instance count doubles overnight and you come to work the next day and you think, oh, I should, I should debug that pretty quick. It's less obvious when you've just had a creeping regression over a period of months and ICE is good at picking up those because I, ICE can go back in time for, for, for many, many months and show how much uh, Netflix is paying Amazon. And so the y-axis is cost per hour. And so I can graph all the different applications, all the different products that we're using from Amazon and, and try and nail these creeping uh, cost growths. It also helps direct engineering efforts so that we know what to, uh, to attack. I, I'm sorry, I think this is the most redacted picture I, I have in my slide deck uh, because it has exactly what we're paying Amazon down to the cent, but uh, it's useful for us. It, it, just the point is having a tool like this is really useful for performance analysis uh, because it is about price performance, it is about what you're paying and, and what you're getting in return, and so we do track that quite closely. So now this might make a bit more sense. Um, we're starting with Atlas Alerts, go, uh, go to dashboards, custom dashboards, Kronos will often tell us, uh, gives a really important clue about what, what happened, what changed recently, drill down into Atlas Metrics UI. The checking dependencies might tell us, go, go look at a different service team or a different target, rinse and repeat, um, until we get to the point where we need to go and do root cause instance analysis. Or, um, if you don't care about Netflix's internal tools, just to describe them, uh, using generic terms. And so you have alerts, you have custom dashboards, change tracking, metric analysis. And your architecture may already have some or all of these. So uh, as we've found, it's important for doing what we do at scale. Last is instance analysis. So once you're in an instance and you want to root cause it and find out why it's uh, behaving the way it is. And so we want to locate, quantify, and fix performance issues anywhere in the system. Um, instance tools. On Linux, we'll use everything. So top PSP stat, uh, all of the system tracings, CPU performance counters, uh, and also application profiling. Um, I've got a, a, a diagram of, these are the, the tools we're using uh, in an AWS EC2 Linux instance. And uh, I've grayed out a couple of them because you need PMCs enabled for them to work. I'll explain that in a moment. Now the Linux performance analysis tools, they're actually pretty straightforward, how, how they all work inside uh, EC2. Uh, the way hardware virtualization works is you have virtual CPUs, you have virtual devices, and so a, a lot of the tools just work the same as they have worked traditionally. 
This is completely different once you do do uh, once you do I almost said doc once you do containers uh, containers which of which there is a consumer called Docker which is which is uh, growing in pop popularity uh, because you you, you know that uh, it's it's taken over the world when instead of saying containers I just say Docker to mean containers but that's different because then when you start using the uh, Linux tools you do have to be aware of how they expose um, the host tenant because instead of having these virtual CPUs and virtual disks that ISTAT and MPSTAT can look at, now you're looking at a physical host. And so things get, get quite different. And we do have some containers we're using at uh, Netflix. And so we do get some exposure into how, how performance observability will actually differ a lot. But for just hardware virtualized instances, things are mostly the same. Uh, of course, you can't see the host directly, so you can't see other tenants. But uh, uh, the way a lot of the tools work is the same. And of course, if there are some specific things we can't see, we can use micro-benchmarking to investigate. Challenges for instances. Uh, application profiling turned out to be, turns out to be more challenging than I would have thought, um, now that I'm really getting into Java and Node.js application profiling. And then the other two challenges, and I, uh, I expected this when I joined Netflix, and this is something that, that I'd often wondered about, is how do you do really good root cause analysis on Linux on EC2. Because Linux doesn't have, uh, doesn't have D-Trace yet, uh, or, or an equivalent yet, and doesn't have, and I wouldn't expect EC2 to have access to the CPU performance counter, so clearly I can't do any of those, uh, that type of analysis, the low level analysis. And so it was surprising what I, what I found out. Application profiling to start with, we found many tools that actually don't work. Uh, if you use Java HProf or many other tools, if you actually start running some test applications with known workloads and then comparing numbers, these, these don't work. There's all sorts of issues where they're, not, they're sampling based on safe points uh, or yield points instead of doing it asynchronously. Uh, the, the profilers aren't accounting for, for GC time or other J, JVM time. Uh, they're treating the runnable state. The runnable state in Java, what, what does that mean? Uh, a lot of tools will tell you runnable, and then, then if you look at the stack trace, it says, oh, I'm runnable, but I'm in epoll wait. It's like, I don't think you're runnable, I think you're asleep. Uh, so runnable is, is, it gets confusing, because there is different terminology. There's, there's the Java JVM terminology, and then the operating system kernel t terminology. And uh, in kernel terminology, runnable means I'm ready to go, like put me on a CPU run queue, and I will start running. Uh, whereas in Java, runnable doesn't necessarily mean that. So you could be blocked on epoll wait, sleeping for an I.O. event, but it's still marked as runnable. Anyway, uh, issues like that we found, found um, to make uh, many profilers inaccurate. Stack profiling can be problematic. Uh, Linux perf events, the JVM throws out the frame pointer. So I, I thought I'd seen kind of my fair share of frame pointer issues with GCC doing the omit frame pointer stuff. But it turns out Hotspot does it as well, just to make life even harder, um, and that breaks stack traces, which is really, really infuriating. And so if you're using Linux perf events, you're using basically any, uh, any standard system tracer to look at what Java is doing, it can't walk the stack because the, fra the frame pointer register is used by Hotspot as a performance optimization that I don't think makes sense anymore. Um, and uh, I did raise this on the Hotspot compiler devs mailing list, and they said they might fix it in the next version of Java, and actually give us the frame pointer back, which would be great. Uh, also, Twitter fixed it, and they've got their own open, anyone from Twitter? So Twitter fixed it, own, they've got their own open JDK fork, where they've fixed the frame pointer, uh, so that they can use Linux perf events to do profiling of Java, which is really cool. And that's, I wanna be running that fork right now, or I'm just gonna open up the Hotspot source code and try and fix it myself. So that's a problem. It actually breaks D-Trace as well, and that's been known since 2005. And so it, it kind of breaks everything, which is really annoying. Uh, flame graphs, it, it, without working stacks, you can't do flame graphs, and we're, f and we're finding flame graphs are solving lots of issues, so we do care about it. How we're actually doing Java profiling, uh, there is Java Flight Recorder, which is actually pretty, a pretty decent product. CPU and memory profiling, you do have to pay Oracle money. Um, then there's this thing called Google Lightweight Java Profiler. Uh, Google are well aware of the issues of Java profilers and have come up with their own profiler. And 
as, as far as I gathered, the engineer who worked on it was going, to, was going to release it open source, but instead released just basically a proof of concept open source. And that proof of concept is enough to do uh, fairly decent profiling. I do want to enhance it. Um, and so it's the Google Lightweight Java Profiler. I've got some links there. And at various other times, we'll use your kit and, and other stuff as needed. So with the Google Lightweight Java Profiler, I can do Java plane graphs, which is great. And I can see uh, the ancestry of stack frames. The wider the frame is, the more time was spent in that area. And I can mouse over frames to quantify. So you mouse over a frame, it says, oh, you spent 82% 80, of your time in uh, Apache, Coyote, abstract, whatever, and quickly quantify to the engineering teams, if you fix this frame, or if you fix this code path, your app can go five times faster because it's 80% of the CPU cycles. That, however, once you're using something like uh, many of the Java profilers, e even a Google Lightweight Java Profiler, you're still only looking at the Java code being executed. I want to know all of the CPU cycles. I also want to know what's happening for JVM internals, and also in the kernel, and also in the system. And so we use perf events for that, the perf command, to sample everything else, uh, including node.js. Uh, and and it it's, works really well. Uh, perf events is actually part of the Linux kernel tree, although you usually have to package add it. And so there's an example, perf CPU flame graph. So this shows everything else that's happening on the system. So there's kernel TCP IP stacks, lock time, GC time. I can just quantify GC time straight away. Uh, know how much CPU that's burning. This, in fact, I've got the idle thread. I've got WRK, which I was benchmarking. On the left, there's this uh, plateau, which is missing Java stacks. That's what, if, if the frame pointer wasn't thrown out by the hotspot team, you would then have a tower on the right showing the actual Java code that was being executed. Um, at the moment, we kind of have to do two flame graphs, do the internal Java one and then the system-wide one, and then mentally paste them together. I, should, I suppose I could just write the code to do it. And mentally paste that Java one on the bottom left, because that's where that one fits. Uh, I'm not going to write that code, because if I'm going to write code to fix this, I'm going to get hotspot and give me the frame pointer back, and then we'll do the flame graph all at once. Node.js, you can do flame graphs on Linux as well. And uh, we, we've got uh, Node.js running. If you're on Node uh, version 0, 11, 13 and onwards, uh, the V8 team added perf basic prof. So that creates a map file so that perf can do symbol translation. And on the bottom right is a, a node.js flame graph, which shows CPU time. There's a bug with it, which I've filed. Um, the map file can grow over time. So we do want to get that fixed. So at the moment, it's, it's more for canary analysis than, than having it turned on all the time in production. But once we get that bug fixed, it will be on all the time. So flame graphs are actually great. Is anyone using flame graphs? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Have, have at least a dozen people. Um, flame graphs are great. Um, they, they really help you solve the low-hanging fruit. Uh, so if you aren't using them yet, a lot of this stuff is open source, so you can uh, go ahead and, and start using them. Uh, we're automating their collection for different services. And there, there are other flame graph types that are useful as well. Now, Linux tracing is this is when I thought that things would get really more challenging, and I thought that things wouldn't, uh, would be uh, quite sad. There are just too many choices, and many are still in development. Ftrace, perf events, eBPF, and so on. A system tracer is needed to root cause many issues. Uh, I'm quite familiar with this of the dtrace books. I've, so I, can, I can go through all the, I, I know quite well all the case studies and re uh, reasons we need this. Now, as it turns out, Linux has ftrace and perf events in the kernel source, which can satisfy many needs already. And this is what I found was surprising uh, going to Netflix. And now we're using this quite a lot. So ftrace was added in 2.6.27. It's one of the good th things is it's already enabled on all our servers, because our servers are 3.2 or 3.13 or, or something else. Uh, and I've been creating front-end tools to aid usage for ftrace, because ftrace itself is actually pretty tricky to use. Probably why you haven't heard of it or seen much adoption is the front-end to ftrace is, is uh, not, I wouldn't say it's user-friendly. I mean, it gets the job done, and that's what, that's what matters. And so I've been writing little shell scripts to uh, automate that. Now, even though they're unsupported hacks, because I'm working around missing features, we are using them to solve issues. And I had an article about it published in lwn.net. 
Just, just to give you an idea of that, that kind of analysis, here's uh, IOSNOOP, where I'm looking at, uh, this is disk latency, uh, and that's using, that's running on Linux, using Linux F-Trace. Uh, IO latency, where I'm doing uh, distributions, uh, and that's also using Linux perf events or F-Trace. Open Snoop to see what files are being opened. Uh, funk graph, so I can go, I can pick a kernel function and then look at the uh, leaf or child calls that it's making to understand that in more detail. It's also giving me durations in microseconds. Uh, and K-probe is another example. K-probe lets me uh, dynamically instrument kernel functions and I can pick out arguments. I can do filters as well. And the filter is done in kernel, so it's efficient. So these have proven very, very uh, useful for doing low-level uh, root cause analysis of kernel issues, of which we've had some. Uh, when you're running Linux this hard, there's, there's, there's certainly things you'll, you'll hit. Um, just to give you an idea of where those, those perf tools fit together. Uh, we're also using ftrace, or perf events for tracing disk IO and other latencies as a heat map. Uh, I think I actually have, I've still got the connection up. So I've got um, some of my perf tools here on a, a server. Um, and just to give you an idea. So let's trace all kernel functions starting with the letter Z. Letter Z. Okay, so, uh, and now I've got uh, calls per second. I might say func graph uh, zone statistics. This might be really boring. Okay, that's pretty boring. Um, I might want to know how we got there, so let's dynamically uh, trace it. Kprobe, let's do stack traces of zone statistics. I'm making, so I probe that. Okay, so I'm doing zone statistics from, I actually have not done this, but this is not a prepared demo. Um, so I'm reading this for the first time as well. Do fork. Okay, so we're doing zone statistics out of copy process. Okay, all right. Um, really useful for, for code exploration and understanding, um, quickly understanding what's going on. And I can use these tools to instrument arguments and, and, and whatnot. Uh, so, and this system is, this is on EC2, this is uh, Linux 3.2. And so I'm able to do some uh, fairly useful uh, dynamic tracing of kernel functions. Uh, what else have we got? Open Snoop. Open Snoop's telling me what's being opened every second. So yeah, uh, syslog D. Uh, exec Snoop. Actually, these, all these scripts have uh, usage. Use, these are all open source, so you can use them. Let's see who's calling bash. So I don't need N, do I? And if anyone's calling bash, I then need to go and patch it. So no one's calling bash. What if I run bash in the window? Okay, so bash is, is, uh, was just called by process ID 11391. All right, so you get the idea. So the, the perf tools, so far I've only got a handful of them, but uh, it's, it's been great to see that some functionality does exist for doing dynamic tracing of, uh, say, kernel events, and there's also the uprobes user level as well. It doesn't do everything that dtrace can do yet, uh, but it's doing a lot more than I thought was possible. So, and also we're doing heat, latency heat maps are awesome, uh, and uh, we're, we're starting to use that as well, just in an ad hoc way. Uh, other tracing options, system tab we actually do have installed on systems. Uh, it's the most powerful of the system traces. Uh, we'll use it as a last resort for deep custom tracing. Uh, I've historically had issues with it. I don't know if they're present in the latest version, but with the Netflix fault tolerant architecture, if I panic a system, it doesn't actually matter because Hystrix will automatically time out the dependency requests and the ASG, the ASG can just replace an instance if it goes bad. Um, you might think that, that I've inadvertently become the panic monkey if I, if I panic things with a uh, system tap. And so when I first joined Netflix, I uh, used system tap within the first few weeks and panicked a, a live production system. I was like, oh no, what have I done? This is terrible. <laughs> so where will I confess in the chat room? And it's like, who cares? It's like, Hystrix has dealt with it, fault tolerant architecture, it's probably already gonna be, the instance will be replaced pretty quickly. So it was amazing to see that stuff work, a relief. So in our environment, we can actually use more dangerous tools. That may not be the case for you. 
So you might need to think about that. Another thing our environment affords us to do is to do canaries. So I can create, well, I've got canaries of OmniOS um, on EC2 where I can use Dtrace. Uh, I haven't done it yet, but I could also create canaries of FreeBSD. Um, FreeBSD on EC2, they've done a lot of the PVHVM driver work for performance. So that's an interesting, that would make an interesting canary as well. And who knows, a freedom and responsibility, someone, a service team could just, one day a service team could tell me they're running FreeBSD in production and, or, or OmniOS, and then, then I have to debug it much, much more than just a canary. Uh, for Linux tracing future, eBPF is going to provide a, a badly needed feature that's uh, custom in kernel aggregations. I have an example of that there, where I'm actually, this is a, uh, Alexi the coder wrote most of this. This is doing a ASCII heat map um, of doing uh, disk I.O. latency. And uh, the latency is on the x-axis as the time is on the y-axis. It's printing it out every second. And so I've got low latency cache hits, high latency device I.O. This is multimodal, so I've got bimodal. Um, and that's doing in-kernel aggregations. It's really efficient and fast. So it's, uh, uh, it's something we can use. And the last thing to mention is CPU performance counters, and I didn't think this would be even possible at all. And there are two types. There's model-specific registers, which give you basic stuff, like temperature and power, and then there's the performance monitoring counters that give you everything else, like stall cycles and instru uh, uh, instruction cache misses. And it turns out some MSRs are exposed by default in EC2. I'm not sure people have really found them. So I've been publishing some tools that we're now using at Netflix to measure CPU, per CPU temperature, the real megahertz the CPUs are running at, which is really important, because Turbo Boost can mess up any performance comparison when you're trying to, Turbo Boost can make one server run 30% faster than another because it happened to be sitting closer to the air conditioner. And so if you're trying to do any performance comparison and you aren't paying attention to Turbo Boost, your numbers can be just wildly inaccurate. So it's really important to understand what's going on with Turbo Boost, and that's why I wrote Show Boost, which works in EC2, which is great. Um, here I'm actually testing temperature, where I'm doing a synthetic workload, and temperature rises and then falls. Uh, why it falls after, after it's risen so rapidly, I would guess that the system fans kicked in. Uh, I haven't found the register to measure system fans yet. So it's been great to measure that. Uh, PMCs is performance monitoring counters, and that's what you need to do things where the gray arrows are, like uh, using perf or tip top to do memory bus and interconnect work. Uh, Zen technically can do this, but Amazon haven't turned it on by default. So, but it is technically possible. So I've, I've asked Amazon, and maybe if you're, if you're customers, you can ask them too. In the future, this may be, I would like, it to, I would like to see it turned on by default, and then we can do the really low level uh, cycle work. So doing things like instructions per cycle, um, iCache stalls, resource stalls, and so on. And so I, this demo I'm doing, I am actually doing that in a Zen guest to show that you can do this from a Zen guest. So technically, it can be done. If they seem terrifying, um, for advanced performance tools, not everyone has to learn them. In reality, just someone does. And that may be one person at your company, or you might buy a product that does it. And so at Netflix, we're building our own product that does it, which is called Vector and that does, uh, per, it does instance analysis, it gives per second metrics, and can do on-demand flame graphs and heat maps and F-trace metrics and so on, and becomes the last step in our uh, sequence diagram of doing uh, performance investigations. So that's my talk. Netflix architecture, cloud analysis, and instance analysis um, gives uh, some exposure, which I hope is useful on how we root cause issues. And, uh, Thank you very much. And are there any questions? Yes. So uh, the question is, does the Simeon army uh, do faults on some of the like monitoring architectures and the proxy architectures, as, as far as I know, it's, it's turned on for everyone. I've only heard of one service team getting an exception, um, and it was just temporary while they sorted it out. But by default, if you create, uh, but the default, you have to explicitly turn it off. And people don't, it's, it's not nice to turn it off. So yes, it should be on for everything. Including like Zool, including everything. So everything should be, Oh, 
Ah, so the distributed data store, you mean Cassandra? So that was the thing that needed an exception um, because they were sorting out some things. I, like, I, I don't know right now if they still have the exception from the, uh, the instance market. I know what you're thinking because like, it, it, it could um, constantly do rebuilds which would cause a performance issue. And so Cassandra was one thing that where, where they um, didn't want the, the monkey to be on all the time. So, so yeah, they, they, so, so you, you're right. You might, you might want to think about, if your question is, um, there can be um, side effects that hurt performance from that. So it's a good thing to think about. Uh, other questions? Uh, the back, yep. What data stores are you dragging? It is a lot of data behind Atlas. As far as I know, it's going into S3. So, but yeah, tons and tons of data. It, it doesn't keep it forever, so it does throw it out. So there's, there's, a, there's only a window of time. Uh, yes? Um, can you view uh, Kronos events on the Atlas graphs? Uh, there's probably a metric for them, but it's, it's just a different, in terms of doing a mouse over and having it give you a full event, I've not seen that capability. I don't think that's there. It might be there, but I haven't found it. Uh, I, I think we've got time for one more question. Okay, thank you very much.